Welcome to the John Adams Institute. My name is Tracy Metz. Our mission is to bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands. I am delighted that this evening we have with us someone whose work I have admired for many years, Elizabeth Colbert, joining us from home in Massachusetts. And we are coming to you from the theater of our partner, the OBA, the Amsterdam Public Library. We are so glad to be back here. Elizabeth Colbert is a staff writer for The New Yorker and the author of several books, Environmental Journalism. She won the Pulitzer Prize for her previous book, The Sixth Extinction, and this evening she will be talking about her newest book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, and she will explain what the title means. It was translated into Dutch by Rogier van Koppel as Onder een Witte Hemel, De Natuur van de Toekomst, by publishing house Atlas Contact. It is a wonderful book. As a journalist and author myself, I really admire her talent as a writer about the environment for the way she makes complex and nerdy subjects accessible and interesting to a wide audience. And she does it with humor. That is really a gift. Let me introduce you to this evening's team. You see them behind me. I will be here waiting for your questions to pass them on to our speaker. Don't wait, don't hesitate. As soon as a question occurs to you, put it in the chat at the bottom of your screen. And I may actually have a question or two myself. Hans Salen, our moderator for this evening, is the editor of the weekend edition of the Financiële Dagblad, the Dutch FT, and the leading financial newspaper in the Netherlands. He previously worked for the broadcasting company VPRO, the newspaper NRC, and the Flemish daily De Morgen. He was a correspondent in Los Angeles, my hometown, and he wrote a book about literary journalism. He interviewed Elizabeth for the FD. Our co-speaker for this evening is Benam Taebi. He's an Iranian Dutch philosopher and an engineer, the perfect combination for the subject of this evening. Benam is Professor of Energy and Climate Ethics at the Delta, Delft University of Technology, as well as the Scientific Director of the Safety and Security Institute at TU Delft. For the past six years, he has been affiliated with Harvard, with the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. So welcome, Han and Benam, and of course to our guest of honor, Elizabeth Colbert. Over to you, Han. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, for those who, of you who uh, haven't read the book, I will um, give a brief uh, summary of um, Under a White Sky. Uh, with Under a White Sky, Elizabeth Colbert wrote a book about life in the Anthropocene. That is the period in which we live now and which man has become the dominant influence Under of the natural sky. world. Uh, with Under a White Sky, sorry, Elizabeth Colbert me, sorry. wrote a book about life in the... Her previous book, The Sixth Extinction, was about the ongoing mass extinction. This time, she focuses on the attempts to save parts of nature by geoengineering. In America, she reports on attempts to stop Asian carp from swimming into the Great Lakes by electrifying the Chicago River. In Australia, she interviews biologists who engineer coral that will survive warmer seas. Others try to gene edit toads to stop them from spreading. The title of her book comes from perhaps the boldest and most frightening project of them all, Dimming the Sun, by bringing tiny re reflective particles into the stratosphere. Colbert's stories, although mostly tragic, are often funny. Her sentences poetic. Her tone is, al as always, restrained. At the end of the book, she leaves the reader dazzled by the complexity of the climate issue. Often, it seems, the choice is between doing something really crazy or doing nothing and see parts of nature disappear. Now, I would like to give the floor to Elizabeth, who wants to read a fragment of her book. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to virtually be with you. Um, I think that uh, this book should have well, or I hope that the book has a lot of resonance for readers in the Netherlands. Um, as, as the saying goes, God made the world, um, but the Dutch made the Netherlands. And uh, my book, Under White Sky, really 
um, in a sense, t takes off from or extends that idea. Uh, God made the world, uh, but now humanity has remade it. And a lot of the ways that we've remade it, we have come to realize uh, are pretty dangerous. Uh, they're dangerous to other species and they're dangerous to ourselves. And so we are faced with what I would argue is the question of the 21st century, which is what are we going to do about this? And people sort of tend to fall um, into two camps on this question, I think. And I guess I would say I have doubts um, about both. And on one side, there are those who say, you know, in effect, let's just stop doing what we're doing. Uh, that's destructive. Um, in the case of climate change, that would be, let's just stop burning fossil fuels. Um, certainly, there's a lot of discussion about this in the Netherlands these days. Um, and certainly, we ought to stop burning fossil fuels. I don't think there's really any question about that. Uh, but we're now approaching the 30th anniversary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in those 30 years, carbon emissions haven't just not gone down, uh, they've increased radically. Uh, half of the carbon dioxide that humans have emitted over the course of history has been emitted since the world declared in 1992 that we really needed to cut CO2 emissions. So something has gone pretty seriously wrong here. Uh, either we lack the political will, or we lack the tools that we need, or the geopolitics are just too hard, or some combination of all of these. But I think that the nation, the idea that in the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to suddenly do what we have really utterly failed to do over the last 30 years is uh, unfortunately a bit naive. And on the other side, there tend to be those who say, well, technology will save us. Uh, there's always been doom and gloom mongers uh, since Malthus. Uh, two centuries ago, and here we are 200 years later with almost 8 billion people on the planet. So people are ingenious, they always figure a way out. And this way of thinking seems to me to sort of beg the question, uh, precisely the problem is that we find ourselves in an unprecedented situation, a situation that is unprecedented, uh, not just in human history, but in Earth's history. And to imagine that well, you know, somehow we're going to come up with the new technologies that are going to avert this disaster uh, because we have to, seems to me to be a kind of magical thinking. There just are no guarantees here. And as Han mentioned, the ultimate uh, intervention here, the ultimate uh, sign of this in some ways is this idea of solar geoengineering, that we're going to somehow engineer our way out of climate change by imposing a new intervention, uh, which is solar geoengineering. And the idea behind solar geoengineering uh, is on some level a pretty simple one. It's that volcanoes cool the world. Uh, when you have a major volcanic eruption, uh, it has a cooling effect. And volcanoes do this by spewing a lot of chemicals into the stratosphere, which create uh, a haze that reflects sunlight back to space. And at least so the theory goes, uh, people could mimic this. And I'm just going to read a really brief chapter, a brief section from the chapter of the book on geoengineering, and then I'm going to hand things back to Han. And I will explain that one of the potential side effects of geoengineering, and this is where the title comes from, uh, is that we would change the tint of the sky. The sky would become whiter. OK, so, so here goes. Uh, what a volcano does is puts sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, Frank Koich said, and that gets oxidized on the scale of weeks to sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid, he continued, is a very sticky molecule, and it starts to make particulate matter, concentrated sulfur, sulfuric acid droplets, usually smaller than one micron. These aerosols stay in the stratosphere on the time scale of a few years, and they scatter sunlight back to space. Koich is a burly man with floppy black hair and a lilting German accent. He grew up near Stuttgart. On a lovely late winter day, I went to visit him in his office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is decorated with pictures of and by his kids. A chemist by training, Koich is one of the leading scientists with Harvard's solar geoengineering research program, an effort funded in part by Bill Gates. 
The premise behind solar geoengineering, or as it's sometimes more soothingly called, solar radiation management, is that if volcanoes can cool the world, people can too. Throw a gazillion reflective particles into the stratosphere and less sunlight will reach the planet. Temperatures will stop rising, or at least not rise as much, and disaster will be averted. Even in an age of electrified rivers and redesigned rodents, solar geoengineering is out there. It's been described as dangerous beyond belief, a broad highway to hell, unimaginably drastic, and also as inevitable. As inevitable. I thought the idea was entirely crazy and quite disconcerting, Coitch told me. What brought him around was fear. The thing I worry about is that in 10 or 15 years, people could go out in the streets and demand from decision makers, you guys need to take action now, he said. We have this integrated CO2 problem that you can't do anything about very quickly. So if there's pressure from the public to do something fast, my concern is that there will be no tools at hand other than stratospheric geoengineering. And if we start doing research at that point, I am concerned it's too late. Because with stratospheric geoengineering, you're interfering with a highly complex system. I will add that there are a number of people who do not agree with this. When I started this, I was perhaps oddly not as worried about it, Koich observed a few minutes later, because the idea that geoengineering would actually happen seemed quite remote. But over the years, as I see our lack of action on climate, I sometimes quite get quite anxious that this may actually happen. And I feel quite a lot of pressure from that. Um, I should add, one thing I'll add before handing things back to Han is that you may have read there was going to be an experiment this summer, a geoengineering a balloon related balloon flight in Northern Sweden that was going to be uh, launched by the Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program. It has since been uh, postponed because there's a lot of um, opposition from people on the ground in Northern Sweden um, who felt they hadn't been adequately consulted. So that's sort of on hold right now uh, and we'll see where that goes. Thank you. Well, the question that springs to mind like I said, this might be the most crazy story in the book uh, for people who don't know anything about geoengineering, but there are many crazy stories in the book. <laughs> and still, we have to take them seriously, and that's also your position, I think. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you went into this book as a skeptic, you told me before, and um, generally got used to some of these ideas and um, the idea that we might not have another choice than to use some of them. Well, I think that, you know, what got me, um, the, the story that started me out uh, on this book is a story that's actually in the middle of the book, and, and you alluded to it. It's a story about a project that was launched by two marine biologists uh, working simultaneously, but in partnership in Hawaii and Australia. And the idea, it, it, the project was very quickly dubbed the Super Coral Project. And the idea was, um, well, we've already, you know, we've really mucked around with the oceans. The oceans are warming and corals, which are these, you know, tiny gelatinous creatures that build coral reefs. They really don't like warm, warmer water, uh, spikes in temperature. And so roughly half of the Great Barrier Reef, which is the world's largest reef, has um, been lost. The coral cover has been lost in the last, just in the last 30 years. So it's, it's a very dramatic and very frightening phenomenon. Um, and so their, their idea, and one of these scientists I should mention for this audience is, is Dutch, Madeleine van Oppen, who works um, out of uh, the University of Melbourne. Um, and their idea was, well, you know, if we want reefs to survive the 21st century, the trend lines are, are really, really bad. We know that the oceans are only going to get warmer. There's really no uh, way around that, except potentially for solar geoengineering. Um, so we're going to now have to intervene again. We're going to have to somehow nudge or coax corals to be more heat resilient and heat tolerant. And so they were working on sort of conventional kind of hybridization um, ideas, 
but you could easily see this also going in the direction of, of, of gene editing. Um, and on the one hand, this does seem completely, you know, crazy and all borderline impossible. The Great Barrier Reef is covers an area the size of Italy, very difficult for people to manipulate an ecosystem on that scale, even though, you know, on some level, of course, we are manipulating that by just heating up the oceans. Um, but they were very compelling, both of these women, on the idea, well, what are the alternatives? The alternative of doing nothing, we are can be pretty convinced is going to lead to disaster. Uh, and the alternative of trying to intervene may also lead to disaster. But you know, we just don't have a lot of good choices here. And I think that that is the story over and over again uh, in the book. These ideas, it's, it's as Frank Koich said, uh, this, the idea seems totally crazy, you know, until you compare it with the alternatives. Right. Can you tell us briefly how uh, you um, find these stories and how you report them and write them? What, what are you looking for in a story? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, you know, you're looking for people who are doing something interesting. Uh, hopefully the people themselves are interesting. Um, in the case of the Super Coral Project, for example, I went out to Hawaii. The first trip I made was out to Hawaii where I interviewed um, a, a woman who's actually British, uh, Ruth Gates. Um, and she was a very, very dynamic person herself. Tragically, she passed away really when I was sort of midway through the book. Um, and you're looking for, I mean, in this particular case for this book, each chapter is sort of a little bit of a, of a parable in a way and stands in for a lot of other potential projects. So I guess I was looking for stories that seemed to have a sort of resonance and could stand in, in a way, uh, introduced some pretty profound issues um, and also give me an opportunity to kind of delve into some of the science, which is pretty interesting in many cases, certainly in the case of geoengineering, certainly in the case of gene editing, for example. Right. Um, like, like we both said, uh, many of your stories are remarkably uh, funny. Uh, I mean, this is a climate book, so you're prepared for the worst and uh, for, for uh, depressing stories about uh, disappearing nature, and they're all there, but still um, a lot of your observations are, um, are, are a pleasure to read. Um, you called your book a dark comedy yourself. Why did you choose this tone? Well, I think that environmental books tend to be written um, according to a certain, uh, I don't want to say formula, but they have a certain um, payoff. And that payoff is you read this really depressing uh, set of facts or stories, and then at the end, there's some, um, well, okay, it's really bad, but here's what you can do. Here's how we're going to, you know, defeat this problem, uh, solve this problem. Um, and I knew going into this book that um, that was not what I was going to do. In fact, I was going to really uh, question whether any of these, you know, sort of crazy schemes were, were going to work. Um, and so the payoff, as it were, for reading the book had to be uh, that the book was fun, that you had some fun reading the book even though it wasn't going to give you at the end that you know ten point plan of how we were going to get out of this mess. No, I see. Yeah, and um, like you mentioned, um, at the heart of the book is 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 the question um, about our the relationship of uh, of man with nature. Um, you mentioned uh, a scientist like Stuart Brand who said, uh, "We are gods, and we might as well get good at it." And then there are other people who say, wait a minute, we are not gods at all. We are not, far, we are not smart enough to, to be gods, uh, leave nature alone. Where do you stand yourself in this debate? Well, definitely, you know, um, emotionally, I guess, I am in the leave things alone camp, absolutely. <laughs> um, I don't think, I think if we're, you know, I think we are 
as gods in a certain sense, we're just very, very powerful collectively, not uh, individually, but collectively we have shown that we can change the world very radically. I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, this moment in Earth's history, there are very few moments in the entire history of the Earth where conditions have been changing as fast as they are right now. And, you know, to find one, you, you, you might have to go back to the asteroid impact that ended the reign of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. So this is um, a really, really unusual moment, even though it seems to us kind of ordinary. Uh, this is, you know, just what we do. Um, but whether we can apply, you know, so sort of willy-nilly and unconsciously, we've proved to be godlike in our power. But whether we have the ability, and that's really one of the questions, you know, that runs through the book, to apply our intelligence and then consciously change the world in ways that will be beneficial either to ourselves or to other species or both, um, that is a question that remains very, very much open. And one of, one of the reasons for that is that the world is phenomenally complicated. You know, it evolved uh, through, you know, a trial and error uh, over, you know, billions of years. And untangling the many, many relations, for example, let's just take a coral reef. People don't really even understand how a coral reef works. It's too complicated. It's just phenomenally complicated. Um, and so our interventions uh, tend to have unintended consequences. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And whether the unintended consequences are worse than doing nothing or not, that is a question that we're going to just keep facing over and over and over again. Right. Can I ask something, Han? Of, sure, of course. Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned the, uh, your choice of technologies and chapters as parables. I think that's a, a lovely analogy. But it did make me wonder, as also as I was reading the book, were there a whole bunch of other possible technologies that you could have described in the book, or is this it? Oh, no, absolutely. There, I mean, every, practically every day, you know, I read something or hear about something that could have been in the book. Part two. Um, um, yeah, part two, exactly, exactly. More, uh, more white sky, yeah, whiter sky. <laughs> whiter sky. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are many other uh, uh, alternatives that could have been in the book. But at the end of the book, you said, well, corona uh, uh, hit, and I had to uh, stop some of my research uh, in, in, in Medias Res. Um, so there were things that you had to leave out that you would have liked to include. And there's already so much well, in there. Well, I I would say that the vast majority of what I wanted to include is in there, but there were a lot of storylines that I pursued to a certain point and decided they were either too similar to other things. Um, I'll give you an example that I like a lot, actually. Um, there's a a fly, a kind of fly in Scotland. It's called a hoverfly. Um, but it's a particular species of hoverfly. And it's considered to be a pretty important pollinator. And it uh, lays its eggs, the females lay their eggs in these old tree trunks that used to, you know, these big trees would fall over. And then over a long time, the insides of the, of the stump would sort of rot. And there'd be this kind of sawdusty inside where the females would lay their eggs. And that's what, that's the, environment that they need to reproduce and owing to lumbering they don't they don't get that you know they get don't get the big trees falling over they're you know they're they're cut down before that point and you get this kind of you know man-made stump at the bottom and so the flies have nowhere to um, lay their eggs so people have taken upon themselves to sort of create this sawdust mush they go around they find trees tree stumps that have been produced, you know, by, by humans cutting down trees. And then they sort of try to engineer what would, what nature would have done uh, if we had let the trees alone over, you know, many decades so that these flies have a place to lay their eggs. And that struck me as a great story, but it was a little bit too much like uh, the story that I already have in there about uh, the pupfish in Devil's Hole. So that's just one example 
of something that I didn't pursue because it was a little bit too close to what I already had. So you had um, to kill a lot of darlings, I gather. Exactly. Uh -huh. darlings. Yeah, the tree, tree example made me think about, um, you read a lot uh, today about people um, suggesting the idea to, to, to end the climate crisis. We just plant like billions of trees and then they absorb all the... the, the, um, the um, Gases and and um, and problem solved like uh, magic. Yes. Remember who said that? Yeah. Yes. Um, but it's not that simple, um, is it? No, it's not that simple, and it's not that simple for a couple reasons. One reason is, you know, the math just doesn't add up. Um, what we're doing when we burn fossil fuels is we're taking, you know, carbon that was buried underground literally over the course of hundreds of millions of years and we're throwing it up back into the atmosphere. And so, and so that was plant matter. That was plant matter that collected, as I said, over hundreds of millions of years and did and was transformed into fossil fuels. Now, to try to remove the CO2 in real time by using plants in real time, you can see that that's, that that's a problem because we just, you know, simply there's simply not enough sort of space on planet Earth. Now, you can do a lot by planting trees. We certainly should be planting trees. We certainly shouldn't, shouldn't be cutting down forests. Um, and trees will take up CO2 as they grow. And, you know, I don't have the numbers exactly in my head, but, you know, you could certainly suck out, you know, a significant amount of CO2, nowhere near what we put up there, um, but a significant amount by reforesting vast tracts of the Earth. But then you rise into other problems, which is, you know, a lot of those vast tracts of the earth that have been identified as potential uh, reforestation, uh, for re reforestation there, they may be grasslands, they may be grazing lands. I mean, people are maybe reliant on them for food. There are a lot of people on planet earth right now, and there's not that much arable land that we're not using in one way or the other. Um, and then the other problem that you get into ultimately is you, you grow a forest, it takes up CO2 as it grows, it is, it, as it is incorporating, you know, carbon into its, its trunk, you know, and, uh, but then eventually that forest dies and the trees rot and give up their carbon. So you have this cycle where you would need to sort of have constantly growing forests, which give you another, you know, another hurdle to get over. Yes. Well, I think it's, it's time to bring uh, Benam into the discussion because um, we hear a lot of uh, stories from Elizabeth and that make us very skeptical and uh, thoughtful about uh, um, geoengineering and, and all kinds of other techniques. But um, you think that um, we still might need those techniques and that we should be prepared for them and that we should start thinking about using them right now? Well, perhaps I need to take a few steps back before arriving at that conclusion, uh, because uh, I do believe that we need to consider different technologies. Um, uh, going back to your earlier question, where are you on the side of leave the nature alone and all the solutions are in the technology? I think I'm somewhere in the middle of that, those two extremes. Um, because I do believe that a lot should come from engineering and a lot could come from engineering. And think about better combustion engines, think about uh, better actually uh, using up the fuel as we are using nowadays, removing fossil fuel and replacing it by other types of energy production. So a lot of our solutions for the future come from engineering, but not only from engineering. So I'm not only I'm not a techno optimist that thinks that engineering is going to resolve the world, or there is this one solution that that comes down as, as will be sort of uh, come down on, upon us and that it will resolve all the, all the climate change. But we don't seem very eager to adopt those solutions, Benham. Well, there are a lot of <laughs> options there that just... I do, um, I'm happy and, 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 uh, uh, and I hope that we manage to actually sort of keep up that promise, but it's a world ambition at this moment to cut the uh, emissions up to zero and even st introduce negative emissions as of 2050. So that is an ambition, it's been that uh, sort of, it's reverberating throughout actually international policy. At the EU, it's been repeated again. The Dutch policy has been endorsed, has endorsed the policy. So I think that's, the question is, is that soon enough? Mm -hmm. are, they moving, are we moving soon enough? Because as Elizabeth correctly says, we have been actually sort of amassing and accumulating greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and a lot of other important greenhouse gases altogether. 
And it is the accumulation of those greenhouse gases that might lead to a point of no return in the future, which is sort of the horror scenario. You don't want to get there because that means that cutting down emissions is not going to help anymore because the accumulation has received to a point that it will just exacerbate, continue exacerbating. So if we get there, of course, we hope to not get there and to hope to cut emissions soon enough. But if you get there, then you need to actually look for other types of solutions. What are those other solutions? You need to be able to adapt your society very fast. Netherlands being a low-laying country, you need to be able to adapt to the sea level rising very fast. Just imagine we are right now sitting at the library surrounded by water. If the water comes up for one meter in the next couple of tens of years, just this whole area will be flooded. So we need to adapt our society, we need to start changing, and we need to perhaps also look for solutions coming from engineering, such as solar, uh, solar radiation management. I am also very skeptical about the technology. A lot we don't know yet. A lot of risk, potential risks that are, that are known are actually pretty uh, disconcerting because things could go wrong with the ozone, the ozone depletion might happen, things could go wrong with crop growth somewhere, the, uh, risks might emerge sometime in the future we don't know when, uh, risks might emerge someplace earth on the earth we don't know where. So it makes it actually pretty problematic technology in nature, by nature which is completely understandable. You shouldn't actually decide on doing it overnight, and you shouldn't decide on it lightly. But I don't want to dismiss it altogether, because that would be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> right. But this is only, uh, Elizabeth, this could only be a temporary solution, right? It is not a permanent solution. Well, it, it, you know, I, I, it's, not a, <laughs> it's not a solution in the sense that it's a, it's sort of like, you know, Taking you know aspirin for a broken leg, uh, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's something that um, you know takes the pain away. Uh, the problems associated, you know, CO two just hangs around the atmosphere a long time, uh, and so you're masking, you're trying to mask the warming uh, that you're causing. Now, it, it it is often presented, you know, in a sort of its most rational. Um, instantiation, I guess, is eventually you, you will have a point of maximum warming, you know, where you, your, your emissions will, will, will peak, they will reach zero, you know, hopefully, once again, I'm not holding my breath personally for that, but okay, we will reach zero. Uh, and then the natural world will start to draw CO2 out of the air using these very slow processes. Um, and also, maybe we will speed things up by coming up with ways of getting carbon dioxide out of the air, which, you know, include reforestation, but also include chemical processes. Um, and for that time of maximum risk, and that could be a long time. I mean, we could be talking, you know, a century, centuries. That time frame is often not really exactly uh, identified. If you used solar geoengineering to sort of mask some of that top warming, uh, you know, perhaps that would be a way to get both human society and ecosystems like the coral reefs through a really, really bad time. And I completely agree that we cannot, dis unfortunately, we're in a situation where we can't dismiss anything. And I, I thought Frank Koich, uh, you know, the, the, atmosphere chemist, who's a very, very smart and very, very rational person whom I, you know, quoted uh, earlier, you know, put it pretty well. It's, it's like completely insane until you think of, okay, well, what, what other possibilities are there? Right. But, but how would we go about this, uh, Ben? Um, could, could Holland just decide to uh, start uh, solar geoengineering if we want to? Unfortunately, as it stands right now, yes, we can. Uh, I don't think that Netherlands is going to do anything like that. Uh, it's probably something that larger countries might, uh, might start uh, embark on doing. Uh, but one of the issues that comes with actually understanding and, 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 and addressing the ethical issues of this technology prior to even experimenting with it, let alone uh, applying it on a large scale, would be to understand actually the governance issue. Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to decide when to stop? It's also a technology that you cannot just stop all of a sudden because of the sort of potential kickback uh, uh, possibility. You go back to the uh, reverse, you, you go back to the previous effect, it might even exacerbate uh, the previous effects. So this is actually a very delicate matter. Who starts, when you do it, on what scale do you do it, and who's in charge of the decision of continuing it or not, and potential military uh, use of, of this technology also. So it is a very delicate matter. 
uh, that should also come. If this technology is going to be used, it's probably sometime the next, I would think, like not earlier than 15 to 20 years. So we are far away ahead of it to be able to think about them and include those issues in the development. But the governance is one of the major issues that, that needs some serious consideration. But how are we going to get the Americans and the Chinese to, to agree on this? I would start in Europe. I'm a big fan of actually Europe joining forces and having some kind of actually sort of expertise centers and, and decision making at the European level. It's a, Europe is a l fairly small continent and this is, an, this is a technology that will have an impact on the atmosphere. So I would think that especially smaller countries and, and, in, in, and in Europe, I know it's not a fancy thing to call it a, a, a huge uh, success at these, in these days, but it is actually a very unique experiment in governance at a governance level. So I would be inclined to think that this could be something that you could join forces with countries together. Uh, and I think Europe is um, very much suited uh, for, for doing it and, and organizing it transnationally, not only with one country. Mm. As a good example also for other countries that this is a matter of actually transnational decision making. Yeah. And are there already uh, initiatives uh, in this direction? Uh, uh, let me add to that something that uh, you were both interviewed in the Dutch news program Newsuur. And at the end of that program, the, uh, uh, the presenter said that Dutch scientists are working to set up a national expertise center which I had never heard of, uh, to look at both the technology and the ethics of a large-scale climate intervention or interventions. Is that the center that you're talking about, Beno? This is Where an effort that I'm that? involved in, definitely. This is at this moment right at the Dutch uh, uh, level. So within the Netherlands, there is a lot of uh, research going on at the science and engineering part of it that can't, could come together. And an acknowledgement that you need to all sort of front load ethics into the development, not only think about ethics in binary terms, should we do it, should we not do it? Ethics could be much more helpful than that could help steer the development, think about the scale of development, scale of application. Ethics could also be included in whether or not to do experimentation with certain type of technology. Um, so this is indeed an effort at the Dutch level right now, mm -hmm. but the ambition is indeed to sort of expand and, and initiate from the Netherlands to, to, to Europe that this, this should be actually a European effort. Mm -hmm. And if we shoot diamonds into the stratosphere, can we do that just over a, a Netherlands-shaped bit of territory? That wouldn't Which work, and to be sure... Uh, <laughs> we I'm finally have a blue sky, <laughs> and now you're going to make it white again. Exactly, having, uh, having gone through actually a very depressing time here in the Netherlands. No, I'm not arguing for making it white. And to be sure, I'm not uh, arguing for application of this technology at all. I think, again, I'm, I'm also very skeptical about mm. the potential risks that we don't know, that we can't easily adapt in the future. Once you have started, you can't go back. You have to continue doing it, otherwise uh, some, some other uh, uh, effect will come back. What I'm arguing for is actually better understanding the technology, but also perhaps if you start even applying it at the, at the sort of experimental level, like the, the Swedish example that was referred to, think ahead. The problem that were emerging there, they could have thought ahead before, uh, before actually applying it. There was actually a lot of interests that were not taken into account, and that's where, where the controversy came from. Well, there aren't many people in northern Sweden. It was uh, native land. And the issue of native land, especially in the United States, is a very common, it's a very known problem. Mm -hmm. A lot of nuclear waste disposal issues in the U.S. were stranded because of the native land issues, actually. In Las Vegas, actually, in, in Nevada, around Las Vegas, where the Yucca Mountain repository has been built, a lot, the biggest controversy, one of the biggest controversy there was actually the issue of native land. Uh -huh. Right. Elizabeth, what do, you, what do you think of this idea of international cooperation? Uh, 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 do you see this happen? And do you see it happen maybe uh, a little bit easier with uh, Joe Biden in, in office? Well, the question of governance is huge, you know, as, as you all have pointed out. It's, um, it's not clear that it's huger than the technological questions, but it's, it's uh, on the same scale. And there are... Um, there are initiatives, there's a Carnegie Foundation supported initiative called, I think, C2G2, which is actually led by, being led by a European, I think he was Hungarian. Um, and uh, I think being, um, yeah, with foundation money. But, you know, when you, when you think about it in sort of, you know, practical terms, I mean, we, we get together, you know, we haven't been able to get our act together to do what we already know how to do, which is lower carbon emissions globally. There are just a lot of, lot of uh, interests here. I think one of the things that is, it, it seems hard to imagine the world ever. I mean, as you said, Han, you know, how do you get the U.S. and China to 
agree on this. Well, one way you might get the U.S. and China to agree on it is, you know, things are just dreadful um, and no one can think of anything else to do. Um, so you could, I think one theoretical scenario, there are these sort of implausible scenarios of sort of, you know, one rogue billionaire doing geoengineering on, on his or her own. I, I'm not terribly worried about that, but I do think a bunch of powerful nations, you, you have to be nations whose aircraft can't be shot out of the sky because, you know, you're relying on a, on a fleet of stratospheric aircraft. Um, but if the most powerful countries in the, in the world decided to get together um, and do it, I don't think you do need global consensus for it. It's, it's, it's quite possibly a dystopian um, you know, scenario, but it, it, I do think it's possible. We had a question from uh, Johan Herberg exactly on this topic, and he said this uh, solar radiation management presupposes a world government even bigger than a European government. It's not going to happen, huh? A world government probably won't, uh, isn't going to happen, uh, but what we could ach achieve some, is some kind of indeed global consensus. I do agree with Elizabeth on that. And I mean, everybody refers to the uh, lack of agreement when it comes to climate change, but there, is, there has been a lot of agreement. Mm. Doesn't mean that we have done a great job, but since uh, Rio, since, since the first moment of the, the, the Framework Convention was put in place, 1992, up until now, there have been many moments that actually sort of consensus. Paris Agreement was an, a very important international point of agreeing, con uh, consenting on the fact that the climate is changing and that all nations should contribute to resolving it, while a lot of other political developments in the United States and elsewhere came in between. But still, there is a lot that we can do. It's not, I'm not very skeptical in terms of what, uh, that, that we cannot, are not able of doing it at, at a global level. I don't think, I don't believe in a global government per se, but I do <laughs> think it, that there is a lot that we could agree on and we, could, we, we, we do manage to do. Right. Go, going back to uh, the, the, the Biden administration, Elizabeth, um, I read that um, um, they um, produced a plan to conserve 30% of U.S. land and water, in a plan called America the Beautiful, um, and Biden took another, uh, another uh, a few other um, decisions that seem, um, seem pretty um, okay, like the appointment of John Kerry as a special envoy, um, he um, rejoined the, the, the climate, Paris uh, uh, climate uh, agreement, uh, like you said. So what are your expectations for um, uh, the coming four years? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a big one, yeah. I mean, I, I think, and you know, I've, I've written about this. I, I've written, you know, so I'm not saying anything I haven't already said in print, but, you know, I think the Biden administration put in place really a really, really good climate team. They are people, you know, from John Kerry to um, Gina McCarthy, anyway, all up and down the line of the head of the EPA um, are people who know the stakes of the issue, have been working on it for a long time, and really, I do believe, genuinely want to get something done. Um, one thing that you didn't mention, which is, I think, critically important is you know, one of the first things Biden did, he came and he signed a slew of executive orders that basically overturned Trump era executive orders just today in the US or yesterday, I guess, um, the company that was going to build this very controversial pipeline to bring in this very dirty tar sands oil from Canada, the Keystone XL pipeline, which, you know, people may have read all about all around the world. It was so controversial. Uh, that died, that finally died because the Biden administration wouldn't grant the permit. And so a lot of executive actions have been taken, you know, already that are very positive. Now, that being said, you know, I don't want to give everyone sort of a primer on American government, but there's really a limit to what I think the executive branch can do, especially when they're facing a pretty hostile judiciary. Um, so the administration has to walk a very fine line, and what they really need is congressional action. They really need legislation, and that is what has not happened uh, now once again for 30 years. And every day that goes by, unfortunately, uh, the odds of anything happening seem to get, in congressionally, seem to get lower. And so, you know, the other sad fact is we also have 
um, or happy fact, I don't know, depending on how you look at it. We also have elections here in this country every two years for the House of Representatives. So it's not even clear that the administration has four years. They may just have two years and, you know, half of them, the six months of them is already up. So it's a pretty um, open question what they will be able to accomplish. And I don't think anyone knows yet. I think they're going to have to use a lot of political capital to get something significant done. And even then, I'm not sure they will be able to do so. All right. You, um, you mentioned before in Het Financiële Dagblad that um, how difficult it is because uh, scientists can do whatever they want, but it's politicians uh, who decide. The politi political decisions are, are difficult. There might be uh, other people in charge. But in Holland now, we have two famous cases uh, where the judge stepped in, as in the, in the Shell case and the uh, Urgenda case, and said, uh, wait a minute, uh, you go governments, you should stick to your own rules and, um, um, you know, uh, the, uh, stick to your plans. Um, do you see anything of that happen in the United States? Well, I'm actually quite fascinated by this, and I should throw it back to you because I'm, I'm wondering if I should come to the Netherlands and, and write a story. Uh, I mean, what's going to happen? The judge says that, but the judge can't cut carbon emissions. <laughs> that really has to be done, you know, on a um, uh, very nitty-gritty level of, you know, changing out ener energy systems. So I, I'm very curious what's actually going to happen as a result of those court decisions. Um, and I'd be very interested in all of your thoughts on that. But I will say from the perspective of the U.S., there are also similar cases sort of wending their way through the courts. I don't want to say that it's impossible that they could get a positive judgment in some court, um, but I think it would be seen as almost impossible to get a positive judgment these days in the U.S. Supreme Court, which is quite uh, hostile to, you know, the majority is pretty hostile to environmental regulation, or at least so the, so the fear is. Um, and I don't think, you know, I would also say I don't think anyone would argue that, you know, the judiciary is in, an, is in a difficult place here, as I say, because a judge can't cut carbon emissions. That has to be done. Um, that's an economy-wide effort. So I, I don't, I'm, I applaud these efforts, but I'm not sure exactly how they play out. Benham, you have some ideas on this. Well, I was very happy about uh, both cases, uh, particularly the first one, which was a um, sort of revolutionary case worldwide. Um, and uh, what the judge did back then was, if I understood that correctly, applying, uh, sort of appealing to the duty of care that a government has to its citizen. Um, so the judge was sort of forcing and forcing the government to start to speed up uh, the, the cutting of the emission, so it doesn't necessarily cut the emission itself, but sort of force the government to do so. And on the one hand, following the, the political system as the Netherlands is functioning, and you want to keep the executive and the judiciary on two separate lines, and they shouldn't actually sort of intervene too much. On the other hand, the judge is doing something that the government didn't, the politics didn't, and it actually eventually resulted in some interesting developments, and it sort of created a new force of power from um, sort of grass mo grassroots movement, people coming into action, and it's at the least sort of a broader acknowledgement of the problem of climate change. Now many more people are talking about it. So that's the first, that's the first win. The second win is not right now. That if I understood correctly, I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but Shell isn't, isn't uh, appealing. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure. If they didn't they... say they will. No. That's... Uh, that I, might I'm interpreting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They didn't say they will, but they say, okay, we, we're, for the moment we all accept this and we're going to do this, and we might appeal later, uh, if I understand it correctly. Mm. But uh, we have a question from uh, Sietse Wijstra, who is here in the audience with us this evening. He says, "Are there maybe less radical technologies that you could be more positive about?" And shooting diamonds into the stratosphere, of course, is spectacular. I wonder, do we have a cosmic vacuum cleaner that can... <laughs> I, well, anyway, it appeals to the imagination. Yeah. Um, are there more radical solutions that perhaps are a bit more realistic? Um, this is to me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I mean, absolutely. And, 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 you know, 
been alluded to the very, very basic engineering solutions, which I think, you know, sort of across the board, we could all agree on anything from, you know, simply using energy more efficiently to, you know, technologies that are being uh, deployed every single day, solar panels and wind turbines. And um, so there are all sorts of, you know, technologies that are way, way less, uh, you know, flamboyantly dramatic and um, controversial than shooting, you know, sulfur dioxide or diamond particles into the stratosphere. And then in the intermediate uh, zone here, there is, um, and I, there's a chapter, I wrote a chapter of, of Under a White Sky about this, is, you know, will we develop technologies to pull CO2 out of the air on a major scale? And, you know, some of these do involve either manipulating plants or growing plants and, you know, dumping them in the ocean so that they don't rot. But some of them involve other, uh, you know, interesting processes and interesting ideas of, of pulling up, you know, rock that absorbs CO2 that hasn't sort of come into equilibrium with the atmosphere yet and using that to try to suck CO2 out of the air. So there are all sorts of, there's a lot of work in the field of of what is called negative emissions. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is because we're sort of already counting on those technologies. When you hear these scenarios for or this idea that we should try to keep global temperatures from rising more than 1.5 degrees C, uh, which you know I will say we are very close to 1.5 degrees C already, so I'm not sure how realistic that is, but to keep them from um, rising more than two degrees C, uh, We've, we've already sort of built into those scenarios, uh, unless we start really, really radically reducing emissions, and I mean radically and doing it today, uh, we're kind of going to need these negative emissions technologies, which we don't really have now. So that's a sort of intermediate, uh, you know, very ambitious idea, uh, but also not as you know, kind of crazy sounding or as controversial as solar geoengineering. Probably the most uh, low tech solution in your book is uh, a way to uh, approach the plague of toads in Australia, the cane toads, which were brought in to eat animals on the sugar cane, which they probably never ate a single one of, but they multiplied like crazy. And now people are so desperate that they're going out beating them to death with golf clubs. That's not the most sophisticated approach, but it's a way. Well, it's not very effective either. I no. mean, I think it gets... How many it, toads has, can you club to death in a day? Exactly. <laughs> We're talking about hundreds of millions. And even on a good day, maybe you get 100 with your golf club. So I don't think anyone really wants to rely on the golf club. But I think Australians get a certain um, psychic, you know, uh, pleasure out of because they really, really hate these cane toads. Right. If I may back, go back to the technological solutions, um, I, I think it's very important to realize that we need to actually look at the whole spectrum of technologies, indeed lower end engineering solutions, but also a very important technology that needs to be developed between now and 10 years is better storage. If you want to rely more heavily on, on wind and, and on solar energy, we need to be able to store it better and to reuse it better. So a lot of improvement is still to be achieved there. So it's not like that all ice should be on geoengineering as one solution. I love your analogy of uh, the, the aspirin for the broken leg. Perhaps we do need to have an aspirin with a broken leg. I would prefer to have an aspirin than known aspirin. Uh, but between now and the broken leg, there is, a, there, is, there is a very long way to go. And a lot could come from new technology, new developments. And okay. those are less pr problematic technological developments. We have a question exactly on this, uh, Benham, from uh, Henri Maton. Uh, what about nuclear energy? Hot topic in the Netherlands. Hot topic. <laughs> Most certainly. And that's, that's why I keep emphasizing that we need to look at the whole spectrum. Because if you look at the public debate in the Netherlands, um, uh, you see that we are moving away from the gas. Netherlands is a nat natural gas producing country. But we are moving away from natural gas production, which is sort of a political movement, public movement at the national level. We don't want nuclear energy. Coal power plants are being shut down. There is one left is being shut down. That's actually a very good development. So where do you want to bring the, 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 the electricity and energy from? Where, what is actually the solution? Is a solution that you're going to import from the neighboring countries, from France, for instance, that has a nuclear power, uh, nuclear power plants and a lot of export? So the whole picture doesn't add up. 
And we just need to also realize that the picture doesn't add up at this moment. We are moving towards a lot, of, a lot more wind energy. We're lagging behind in Europe, by the way. It's amazing, a country with so much wind, so much potential. We're lagging behind in the, in the numbers. But so the solution could come, should, should come from the across. And in that sort of spectrum, nuclear energy could potentially have a role. But then again, the question is, what kind of technology do you want to apply? What nuclear power plant do you want to actually put there? How many? Where exactly? Mm -hmm. None of these are going to be uncontroversial. And I'm, what I'm trying to argue is that we cannot just dismiss a technology because it's risky. Because whatever we do, we are, being, we are going to be confronted with some kind of risk. Nuclear mm -hmm. technology, the, risk of a, a, the potential risk of a power plant, but also nuclear waste that we need to de uh, deal with. So we need to accept the fact that we are dealing with a lot of risk at this moment, and we need to sort of balance those risks and make a, a well-informed, technologically informed, but also ethically informed choices. Mm. Elizabeth, uh, nuclear energy? I think nuclear energy is, is uh, you know, really interesting and important, and there are, you know, people who say we will not uh, decarbonize uh, our energy systems without it. And there are people who say, you know, we can't decarbonize, you know, it's too dangerous. We shouldn't, you shouldn't even be looking at it. Um, and I don't have a very, uh, you know, well-informed decision um, view on that. The one thing I would say in the U.S., and I don't know if this is true in the Netherlands, but I suspect it is, is it's just really, really hard. It's virtually impossible to build new nuclear. In fact, we're closing our nuclear plants in the U.S. because they're, they're aged, they're getting old, and um, their licenses are, are up for renewal in many cases, and sometimes they're not getting relicensed. Um, so, uh, you know, the question of what we should be doing is, is sort of running into the complicated um, political and economic reality that it's just really, really, really expensive and hard to cite uh, new nuclear. Um, and that gets back to, uh, you know, the, another point that we don't have any storage, long-term storage for nuclear waste in the, in the U.S. at least. And once again, I don't know what the situation is in Europe. Uh, all of our spent nuclear fuel is sitting at the power plants where it was generated, which people would in general in the sort of risk community would say is really risky. It's just a very risky thing. It should not be happening. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I, I want to go back to a little uh, um, broader question. Um, you, you end the book with, with COVID uh, starting. And the, the amazing thing, one of the amazing things from COVID is that a thousand measures that seemed totally impossible suddenly happened because they had to happen. Uh, my question is, why can't we do this for the climate? And that's a question to both of you, actually. Elizabeth, you, you first. Why don't we get our act together and, you know, just make this happen? Well, that's a really good question, although I guess I, I could turn that around and say, well, we, we kind of did treat it like climate crisis. We, we mucked around, you know, we, we didn't use um, all of the best laid plans, you know, all of the plans that the CDC had come up with for dealing with a, you know, a respiratory uh, ep epidemic, which became a pandemic. Um, we could have, we didn't use, didn't do, didn't do what we should have done, and we we know that. And now there are, you know, boatloads of books coming out about exactly how much those plans were sort of ignored. Um, and so, in a sense, I think there is a parallel uh, to the climate crisis. Then we got, you know, then things got so bad, hospitals were, you know, overwhelmed, you know, people dying in 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 the halls, etc. That we did use, we did finally impose. You know, sort of societal uh, measures, and to a, to a certain extent. Now, here in the U.S., once again, people fought over those, and there was a lot of dissension over those. Um, and then, in the end, we sat there, sort of, you know, waiting for the techno fix, which, uh, and you know, quite remarkably, uh, you could say, and it, it, we got. We were very, very fortunate. You know, it wasn't clear <laughs> uh, that we were going to get a vaccine in a year. Um, this is a brand new cutting edge uh, technology, the Pfizer and Moderna um, vaccine. So I, I would say that the, the, the sort of, um, you know, inability to control ourselves does, did play out during coronavirus. And the, the parallels are, you know, depending on how you want to look at them, they're either, 
you know, heartening or, or very, very frightening. <laughs> That's right, because uh, I also there, there's also the, the, the skepticism uh, towards the science, for instance. And I read somewhere this week that uh, only 26% of Americans are actually alarmed by by the climate issue. Um, alarmed? I, yeah. Um, I mean, there's always a report out of Yale University that there's sort of six groups of people in the U.S. And I mean, alarmed is just one. There's probably concerned. I mean, I definitely think more than half the country is concerned about climate change, but but there way well may only be 26 who are you know alarmed. But I'd have to look at the in, internal dynamics of that study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bena, what what are your views on this uh, this topic? Um, I, I, I want to go back to actually an answer I gave earlier. I think that since uh, 1992, the first moment that we agreed on actually acting on climate, there has been many moments of success, many moments of agreement at the global level, which were actually pretty unique moments the Kyoto Agreement, the Paris Agreement. And there have been also successes in the past. The ozone depletion that we managed to stop actually in the 1990s was also based on global consensus and acting upon it. Mm -hmm. Why haven't we done more than we have done until now? I think a couple of actually uh, things that come into play. From the very beginning, it was a broad understanding that a problem of climate change is a common but differentiated responsibility. The term goes all the way back to 1992, the Rio Declaration. So common but differentiated responsibility means that different countries have sort of bird to, to bear the responsibility of climate change and deal with it. But then the question was, and that's also the focus of a lot of these, these political debates and the public debates, but also in the, in the academic literature, whose responsibility and based on what responsibility, how to assign responsibility. So we got sort of entangled somewhere there and never managed to completely come out of that. But again, going back to what you mentioned yourself, the United States as uh, the country that left the, the, the Paris Agreement uh, re-entering, and especially with people like John Kerry and uh, the political ambition at this moment, I am rather hopeful that we, we might actually manage to make some, some serious steps the next couple of years. The question remains whether it's going to be fast enough or not. And then again, that, that, that problem we are not going to resolve very easily because it is common but differentiated responsibility, but also the, the, the sort of unequal dispersal of the consequences is going to be very problematic because uh, from the very beginning we knew that the problem has been caused in one part of the world, it's the, the, the consequences were being felt somewhere else, the problem caused by the industrialized nations throughout the history since the industrial revolution up until now and the consequences mostly actually in low-laying countries in Southeast Asia, in Central Africa. Um, but and at the moment that we get closer to actually problems becoming even worse and exacerbating, I think the political willingness of taking action might be higher and more, and that might sort of be another force behind action. I hope we don't get that that far, and we don't that we would be actually sort of wiser to not wait for that to happen. And I remain hopeful that a lot is already happening at the level of political agreement, but also at the level of technological development. And there is a lot of grassroots movement, and, uh, and a lot is happening there, also from the youth. We shouldn't forget, that's, that's the future. You agree, Elizabeth? Are you hopeful? Am I hopeful? <laughs> I, I certainly think I think there are you know a lot of developments, um, it, certainly including the youth movement, including you know a, a change of administration in the U.S. So I, you know, a year ago I would have said you know it's seemed utterly hopeless, but I would say that there are many hopeful signs. Unfortunately, for every hopeful sign, you know, the, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, the climate doesn't care about politics and doesn't care about how we feel about it and doesn't care about how many people are on the streets. It cares about how much carbon is going into the atmosphere. And unfortunately, the numbers are not good. <laughs> uh, so for every, you know, hopeful uh, societal sign, uh, there are some pretty bad numbers. And as we sort of emerge from COVID, I really think that the big question is, are we just going to go back to doing everything exactly as we did? And, you know, uh, all of these trend lines going, you know, in, in not good directions, uh, or are we, are we going to fundamentally re rethink a lot of things? And, you know, the problem, as, as, as Beno mentioned, was, or a problem is that the developed world has already used the world's entire carbon budget. And that is extremely unfair. The global equity questions are, you know, phenomenally huge. Um, and we have not figured out uh, a way out of that. And those are very, very daunting issues. 
We have a, a question that I think maybe brings this all together finally from Mark, Mark Eink. He says, isn't the problem, we have a lot of technical solutions, but isn't the problem more a social and behavioral issue? We know what we should do, but we don't do it. I think it's both, uh, if I may go first. I think it's both, uh, which it's not just, it's, it's not either or. We do need to change our behavior. The first couple of months of COVID, uh, when the COVID kicked in and there was less aviation, there was a serious impact visible mm. in terms of emissions. So aviation is already uh, adding to the emission. So we do need to change our behavior in terms of uh, flying or, uh, or being more efficient, using less uh, energy. But it's not going to be the problem of climate is not going to be resolved there because a lot of emission is being caused by the industry. A lot of emissions are actually the big players on the, uh, 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 on the corner that are actually sort of causing major amounts of emission. A lot is coming from transport. A transport of goods also. So it's not, we shouldn't focus on only one solution. Not, it's not only engineering, it's not only going to be nuclear, it's not only forestation, it's not only storage. It's actually a compilation of all these things together that should help us resolve the climate issue. Elizabeth? Yeah, I certainly think, I mean, I certainly think that the problems are, you know, if you want to call them social, they're broadly social, but they're not also not straightforwardly social. Um, you know, do high emitting countries like the US, like the EU, uh, you know, do people need to change their behavior and the way they live? Um, you know, yeah, probably, absolutely. Um, but you can't really say the same thing to people who in countries, you know, like India, many of whom don't even have electricity. Um, so, you know, we're, we're we're in a bind, and there's not um, there's not you know a, a, I completely agree. There's not there's not one answer here. We kind of we kind of need everything. We need we need social change. We certainly need technological change, um, and we need to figure out a way uh, to you know affect these changes that that are equitable or at least equitable enough for um, you know a buy-in. Uh, from from major parts of the world and 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 threading that needle as it were uh, has turned out to be extremely difficult uh, and that's why we're in the situation that we're in right now okay I think I have one more question for for both of you and uh, that has to do with a there was an opinion piece uh, this week in the Guardian uh, by two people who were very critical um, on climate journalists but I think this could also go for scientists. And they said that um, climate journalists uh, didn't succeed in um, getting their message across because they were not aggressive enough to push that message. How do you see your own role in this discussion? Elizabeth, Elizabeth you first. Well, I'm happy to say I didn't see that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can send but it I to do, you. Yeah, no, go ahead. I, I want to say it sort of seems to me to have a blaming the victim quality. I mean, <laughs> the fact is people don't, you know, I can only speak, I'm, you know, an American, um, and I've lived in the U.S. pretty much my whole life, with sort of stints in Europe. But, uh, you know, Americans don't don't really want to hear this message. So I, I could write till I'm blue in the face, and to be honest, have written till I'm blue in the face. Um, and it only is going to have a limited uh, efficacy. I mean, the United States of America is a country that elected you know, Donald Trump is president. So I think to blame, uh, you know, climate journalists for our situation, I don't, I don't mean to be too defensive, but it seems to me that that's not really where we should be focusing our energies at this point. Right, clear. What about you, Benham? I would never so seek a solution <laughs> in being more aggressive to start with. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I agree completely with Elizabeth. I don't think that that uh, that we there is something to be blamed. Climate journalists are something to be blamed. If anything, they're actually contributing to more awareness. There's been a lot of discussion whether the message has been aggressive enough or too aggressive. Even some argue that uh, only having a message of this is going to go very bad, awful, and we are going to end in hell is not the message that will come across very well. That's another thing. I don't have a strong opinion on that. What I do say, I can say about science is also. On the science parts, I'm not blaming my fellow scientists at all. But I do know that we did start the communication in the wrong, in the wrong way. In the first days of climate science, we talked about parts per million. Uh, 
as a non-scientist, there is no, you don't hear anything. When I talk about 10 parts per million, that's, that, that doesn't include anything. The, so the language changed act, actually uh, in, in one of the, the conference of parties in, the, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, the language changed into the one and a half degrees, two degrees back then, one and a half degrees after that. So this is a, this is a message that politicians better understand, the society better understands. The, the emission gap reports has been introduced. It's a very interesting uh, uh, sort of showing that clearly on a graph that everybody could grasp. So we are heading for five to six degrees. We need to actually sort of bring it down to one and one and a half to two degrees, preferably one and a half. So changing the way of communicating, it's exactly the same finding, but communicating your findings in a different way brought the discussion on the science part closer to the society. And that was a great win. Right. Okay. Any more questions from you? Uh, no more questions for me, only closing remarks. Okay, then I'll give you the, um, for the closing remarks. Sad to say we've reached the end of our session. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Han. Thank you, Benam. Thank you, Public Library. I hope you feel inspired to read the book, if you haven't already. And if you read Dutch, please buy the Dutch edition. It is so important that publishers like Atlas Contact are able to continue to bring important books like this in translation. We are looking forward to our next event, the last one before the summer, which will be at the beginning of July. Our speaker is the historian Neil Ferguson, who is the official biographer of Henry Kissinger. But in between volumes one and two, he wanted to take a break and have some fun. <laughs> so he wrote a book called Doom, <laughs> The Politics of Catastrophe. Uh, we are also looking forward, hopefully finally live again, to hosting Russell Shorto to talk about his book, Small Time, about the history of his family as members of the Mafia. Uh, and we are very much looking forward at the end of September to receiving Patrick Radden Keefe, who is a multi-talented person. He has made one of the most popular podcasts of 2020 called Wind of Change. Have any of you heard of it? It's a wonderful podcast about a song uh, that may have or may not have been a plot of the CIA. If you can, still listen to it. It's fantastic. But he has also written a book about another very topical issue in the U.S., the opioid crisis. It's called uh, Empire of Pain, and it's about the history of the Sackler family, which made a fortune in pharma and has been excoriated for their role in this newest crisis in the U.S. We're working on finalizing the dates for all of these events, so keep an eye on our website, www.john-adams.nl. And while you're there, you can sign up for our newsletter or make a donation or become a member. We'd be grateful. Thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.